On behalf of the Duke IP faculty, uh, Jerry, David, and myself, welcome. Um, you don't know how happy I am to see you. It means organizing the conference is over. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are other reasons, but, but I'm just, you just don't know how happy I am to see you. This is the finest collection of minds on intellectual property since Jefferson dined alone. Um, the, um, but it is, in fact, uh, the finest collection of thinkers and uh, doers on this subject that I could possibly imagine. I'm just uh, overwhelmed. Um, this conference is made possible by a, a very generous grant from the, the Center for the Public Domain, and I'd like to thank the Center, and in particular, uh, Laurie Racine, the president, uh, whose work uh, has made this possible. Um, it, apart from her many contributions to the conference, intellectual, organizational, supporting, and so forth, she picked the graphic designer. So, I mean, I think that's the, probably the single most important thing. Um, I'd also like to thank the people who actually made the conference happen. Um, Eileen Wojciechowski, uh, my assistant, Patty Meyer, Kurt Maletsky, Mike Swanigan, who did the wonderful website, Wayne Miller, who's doing AV, and many others. Um, they really uh, did a fabulous job, and I'd like to thank them. Um, uh, they are making a little framed sign for me that says, never again. Um, so uh, our time today is a little tight, precisely because of the richness uh, of the, the schedule. So we're going to try and uh, sort of keep relatively close to time. We started about 10 minutes late, and we'll sort of run 10 minutes late through the, through the day. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that, in particular, I do hope that both in discussion here in question and answer sessions and on the web board, um, that we um, sort of complete the discussion which is started in the panels, um, that I actually see the conference as sort of continuing after the conference is actually over. We have a web board set up for people to discuss the papers and the, the topics of the conference, and I really would like that actually to be a continuing focus and hope people will, will use that and we'll have some announcements about that at the end. Um, so before I begin with the actual, my actual talk, um, I, as I was reading through the papers again last night, it struck me that one point um, actually bears making, although I think for most, many of the people here, it, it's no surprise. Um, the, the theme here is that to a striking degree, everyone who wrote for these papers acknowledges an extremely important role for intellectual property, um, though luckily they differ on what that role is, but, um, but, but everyone said, um, that there was a role for intellectual property. Many of the people, not all I think, but many could actually wax quite rhapsodic about the, the genius of the intellectual property system uh, and the things that it could offer us. Um, the, th the thing that they also do, though, in their different ways, these papers, is to say that the public domain is just as integral to our society's innovation system, culture system, science system, to the structure of its networks, to the content of its culture, as intellectual property. There have been thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of conferences on intellectual property. To my knowledge, this is the first national conference on the public domain. And I think that point kind of makes more eloquently than I will do in the succeeding 40 minutes uh, the need for the conference. Uh, it shows, I think, that intellectually, as well as organizationally, as well as in terms of uh, analysis and so forth, this is something that was much needed. So my, my talk is supposed to provide a little bit of a framework for the conference to explain why we organize it and to set out some goals for it to achieve. Um, it comes in the traditional two parts. The first tries to show you that there's a problem, and the second tries to explore some of the tools for the solution. But it begins with rhyming political theory, which I actually think is going to be my next um, academic specialty after this conference. I've become more and more interested in it. It seems to me all the great ideologies can surely be expressed in rhyme, and I wanted to pursue that thought. The, the, the rhyming uh, political theory that I, I begin with is, uh, is, um, is a poem um, from the, uh, the, written at the time of the English enclosure movements. Uh, the law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. The law demands that we atone when we take things we do not own, but leaves the lords and ladies fine who take things that are yours or mine. Um, the thing that I like about this poem, apart from the fact that it rhymes, is that it's one of the, the pithiest condemnations of the English uh, enclosure movement, the process of fencing off common, formerly common land, turning it into private property. Um, it manages in a few lines to criticize double standards. One group is being asked to respect property, while another group is having their property, and at the same time having their property taken away from them and given to, uh, to the rich. Uh, it says that uh, 
Maybe the law has a role here in creating property rights. Property rights aren't natural. It says that something that is formerly common, formerly owned by all, is being taken away and given to a particular group. It does all this in about eight lines. Never get tenure with it, of course, but uh, nevertheless, it seems to have a certain uh, pithiness to it. And like most of the criticisms of the enclosure movement, it focuses on uh, what, what the author saw as a kind of rapacious, a state-aided privatization of something that is inherently, or at least formally, public or common, or perhaps even just outside the property system altogether. Um, my other um, writer, this one from a little earlier, from the 16th century, Thomas More, one of the only good uh, political theorists who are also saints, uh, wrote that there are two by my count, although I'd be willing to debate that point, um, wrote that um, Augustine, um, you're, uh, thank you, John Perry. Um, uh, he said, your sheep that were wont to be so meek and tame and such small eaters in England now, as I hear, become so great devourers and so wild that they eat up and swallow down the very men themselves. They consume, destroy, and devour whole fields, houses, and cities. Uh, the reason that he's conjuring up these horrific sheep that sound sort of, sort of some kind of insane dolly rampaging over the, the countryside is not a criticism of transgenic uh, species, but rather the process of enclosure which took the sheep uh, gave them the formerly common land to them for pasturage. So these lines about the enclosure movement, the enclosure movement, uh, which actually, depending on when your date uh, uh, is, could start at the 15th century, runs all the way through to the late 18th or 19th, um, have a number of things in common. Mark, come on down. There's a seat at the front. Um, they say that this is an enclosure movement which is rapacious. They stay, say that it is something which is, private, is public, is being taken away. Um, and they also say that it has devastating effects on the society. And, and in response to this claim, the, econ the economists, and in particular the economic historians, say, oh, too bad, boo-hoo-hoo. Um, you say that this is a, um, uh, a world which is um, uh, wonderful, which is communal, and so forth. But what it also is is a world that just can't feed itself. And what enclosure may have caused social disruption, it may have been hard on some of the people, but what enclosure also did is it developed agricultural surpluses. Uh, it actually allowed the survival of a society after the mass deaths of the, of the, the, the plague. Enclosure worked. Turning the formerly common land into private property worked. Private property saves lives. If you want to actually get your economy working, take the inefficient commons and take it in, turn it into an efficient privatized world. What does all of this have to do with intellectual property? Well, the answer, I hope, is obvious but not entirely obvious. Um, this is, in the view of many, and I'd have to say I'm one, a second enclosure movement, an enclosure not of the arable commons of old England but instead of the commons of the mind. Um, things which had formerly been thought of as common, as property available to all, or as outside the property system altogether, as things which weren't reached, whether we're talking about the human genome, or ideas that are the basis of some business method, or of facts which were supposed never to be covered by intellectual property, um, or of copyright, uh, of, of books which have been, uh, which were written uh, more than a hundred years ago, but which are still protected. All of these things have been taken out of the commons or not allowed to go back into the commons. And the, uh, in fact, in, in updating my syllabus for my intellectual property class, I, I sort of look back at my confident um, uh, notes about, well, of course, this could never be covered by intellectual property, I said. Uh, it's a well-known fact that we have an exception here. Um, it's a well-known fact that the term only lasts this year, and I've just gone through, and the, the page gets shorter and shorter as the list of limitations, what you might think of as kind of the restraining walls on intellectual property, the walls that protect the public domain, fall one after another. Um, my confident pronouncements are now false. Um, in particular, if intellectual uh, property law in the United States had an article of faith, it was that Facts and ideas could never be owned. Um, one could own inventions, one could own original expression, but the facts below and the ideas above were always going to remain in the public domain. A narrow layer of intellectual property was braided through a rich factual and a rich idea commons, encouraging people to mix the two together and make things, either expressive things or inventive things. What we see is that basically spreading out in ways that I describe in my paper and won't go into here, but I think spreading quite widely.
The expansion is more than a formal one as well. It's not just that the laws cover more things, cover them longer, cover them in more ways, cover them with greater penalties, cover them in places we never thought they could. There's also a practical dimension to it. A number of people in this room, uh, Pam Samuelson, Jessica Littman, uh, many actually of the people here have pointed out that it used to be quite hard to violate an intellectual property right. You actually had to work at it. You know, um, you know I give you a book, you know, how do you violate the intellectual property right? Well, you know, I mean, it used to be, I'll get a printing press, I'll set up a competing print run, uh, you know, I'll manufacture an invention uh, and sell it. Now, the triggers of intellectual property liability are literally on the desktop. I mean, both metaphorically on the desktop, the desktop of your computer, and on the desktop. In a networked world, copying is routine. It's a part of communication. It's a part of transmission. It's a part of reading. Um, so right at the moment, as the rights are being expanded, they also intrude much more deeply into our actual lived space. Intellectual property goes from being a form of industrial regulation, a kind of unfair competition policy, to becoming a form of personal regulation on a very intimate level, extremely uh, backed by extremely powerful laws and, and, and penalties. So um, what I've argued is that the older strategy of intellectual property is this kind of braided one, a thin layer of intellectual property rights sort of wrapped around a commons. And even there, all kinds of exceptions written in fair use to allow for commentary, criticism, decompilation, uh, exceptions, uh, ways in which intellectual property couldn't be claimed. And what we see is the erosion of the limits, the expansion of the rights. So I've argued then that there's, there are these profound similarities between the first enclosure movement and the second enclosure movement. Um, is there also a similarity to the claim that the second enclosure movement, like the first, will ex yield this fabulous explosion of innovative, productive power that it will, so to speak, feed the cyber peasants of the, of the 21st century, that it will uh, give us wonderful new drug, drugs and gene sequences, fabulous new entertainment products, great software, wonderful internet networks, and so forth. Um, that's certainly what the supporters of Enclosure tell us. They say, you know, once again, we've got a bunch of economically illiterate peasants, except now they're on the internet. Um, um, you don't realize that, you know, all this information wants to be freeze, just bunk. If you want progress, you need property. Property saves lives. We say that literally with uh, gene sequence patents, stem cell patents. Uh, property also saves our culture and our economy. We say that over the DMCA. So are they right? Uh, well, there are some fairly obvious differences between the, the commons of the mind and the grassy commons of old England. For a start, most of the things that intellectual property covers are what economists call non-rival. Economists have a, just a wonderful facility for language. It's, one wishes one could be as eloquent as they are. Um, and non-excludable. It's, you know, it just trips off the tongue. Um, the thing about a, a gene sequence or an MP3 file or an image is that they can be used by multiple parties. Uh, my use does not interfere with yours. The argument for the enclosure of the grassy commons was at last the feudal lord will be able to invest in the drainage schemes to develop things, will stop the multiple overuses, the overgrazing, the lack of... Um, um, uh, the lack of conservation of a resource because everyone uh, will be uh, having their sheep gobble away as fast as possible. The overuse problem, which is uh, a problem in the aptly named tragedy of the commons, is not, generally speaking, there are a few exceptional cases, a problem with intellectual property. Uh, we don't say, you're using that idea too much. You're using that gene sequence too much. Uh, that MP3 file, you know, can't be played by too many people or it will explode, it will wear out. Um, the problem is rather the other side of the, the tragedy of the commons, the collective action problem. How do we allow for the incentives to encourage the production of these goods in the first place? Um, the idea here is that with non-excludable and non-rival goods, goods that I can use and you can use goods that it's hard to exclude me from using one unit of the good satisfies potentially an infinite number of users. We need to step in and create a, a limited monopoly, an intellectual property right. This is the solution to the public goods problem. Um, and along with this general argument goes actually a historical argument, a, a teleology of intellectual property maximalism that says intellectual property is basically a solution to the, the cheapness of copying. In, in, if you imagine a line with a monk in a scriptorium on one end, copying out Aristotle's rhetoric or poetics and, and, and Gutenberg in the middle and the photocopier, the VCR and the internet, you Napster at the, the far end, you see a line of copying costs going down. We don't need intellectual property to deal with the monk. The, the, the manuscript is rival. 
right? And it's very excludable. It takes you three months to, to, to copy a book. Um, as we move forward, as we start to get to Gutenberg, we say, well, maybe we need the Statute of Anne for, uh, for, for Gutenberg, although, in fact, the Statute of Anne was a long time after Gutenberg. Um, and Elizabethan theater didn't suffer noticeably. Um, we, um, maybe we need this level of protection. And as, as we move through the photocopy of the VCR, as the cheapness of the, as the copying costs lower, of obviously, says these analysts, intellectual property rights must increase. So that as copying costs fall to zero, intellectual property rights sort of asymptotically approach perfect control. We need total control at the moment when the file is completely non-rival. Everyone can be listening to my MP3 file at the same moment that I'm playing it myself. So is all of this true? Um, no. Uh, but I realize I have to provide some basis uh, for that uh, argument, which I do uh, more in my paper and in my other work. Um, the first point is, of course, that uh, this is a very one-sided analysis. Uh, lowering of copying costs does increase the possibility of copying and therefore of illicit copying. It also, of course, dramatically expands the size of your market, lowers your distribution costs, lowers your advertising costs, uh, increases your ability to sell to people you'd never thought about before, allows the possibility of large permanently functioning search engines, which you can use to track people who are trespassing on your intellectual property rights. So you don't need to be an economic... Uh, Nobel laureate to think, well, maybe we'd weigh some of those benefits to producers against the costs and kind of figure out whether they were better or worse off. Of course, we don't do this with intellectual property. In this area alone, in any other government pro uh, program right now, the idea is that this major subsidy is to be handed out without empirical proof uh, of its necessity and to be expanded without it. I mean, take something that's much more controversial, like you know, teaching poor kids to read. Uh, the Head Start program, well, where's the empirical proof that those reading gains actually carry on through into the first grade? You know, we need some, we need some better evidence here before we're going to actually, you know, fork out a few pathetic million dollars for this. But when it comes to intellectual property, you know, so may I have another heaping slice of Monopoly rent? Oh, please. Um, at least, uh, you know, uh, out, of, out of respectability, if nothing else, we might pretend to provide some better empirical uh, 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 justifications for these rights, although, you know, I, my own personal favorite is uh, increasing copyright terms for dead authors, which one, you know, one can only imagine the grave woods of Hollywood spinning in a ferment of creative frenzy. Um, so um, there is another point, though, apart from the, 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 the weakness of the argument, and I do think it's a weakness, the weakness of the argument for the need for increased copying, there's the second point, which is that up to now, um, we have taken as a given the idea that the incentive system works pretty much the way it always has, that the changes in all of these technologies don't change the way in which people produce stuff. They merely change the way in which we have to fine tune the law in, a law in order to allow the producers to capture some uh, surplus value. But is that true? That is to say, should we be thinking about the effect of these technologies on the productive end, not simply taking as a given that everything will be produced in the same way as it is and, and distributed, and we just have to figure out uh, what kind of return the producers get? The answer, again, I think is no. Um, I won't go into it here because I don't want to go over my time. But the open source software movement strikes me as a wonderful example of the ability of a global network to transform the conditions of productivity. Um, I actually have a, a, a nice, uh, I think, description of it. Unfortunately, both Eben Moglen and Yohai Benkler have nicer descriptions of it, which I find slightly irritating and, and perhaps disrespectful. Um, uh, from Moglen, incentives is merely a metaphor, and as a metaphor to describe human creative activity, it's pretty crummy. I've said this before, but the better metaphor arose on the day Michael Faraday first noticed what happened when he wrapped a coil of wire around a magnet and spun the magnet. Current flows in such a wire. But we don't ask what the incentive is for the electrons to leave home. We say that the current results from an emergent property of the system, which we call induction. The question we ask is, what's the resistance of the wire? Moglen's metaphorical corollary, or corollary, to Faraday's law says that if you wrap the internet around the, every person in the planet and spin the planet, software flows in the network. It's an emergent property of connected human minds that they create things for another's pleasure. The point here is 
that if you assume a random distribution of motivations in each of us, you create out of vainglory, you out of the love of creation, you because you're a true altruist, you because you hope to get a better job, and so on, and we make the cost of co participating in a collaborative enterprise incredibly low and allow you to network uh, with others at an incredibly low cost, there'll be a really large number of you that will get together and make things. Right? So the answer to the incentives question, what motivates them, is the wonderfully dismissive, it doesn't matter. At a low enough level of transaction costs, there will be motivations and stuff will get made. It's an empirical question how much stuff, in what areas, and how useful it will be. But it will happen. We know that because it has happened. It's a wonderful existence proof. So two problems. We're moving in a direction of intellectual property maximalism with arguments that don't justify themselves even in the old terms of you know, the standard arguments for intellectual property as a public goods problem. And we're also running the danger that we might actually curtail the possibility of new and more interesting forms of collective and distributive uh, productive activity. It's a, both an old mistake and a new mistake. How nice. Um, so where does all of this lead us? Um, I've said that this is the second enclosure movement, and in a lot of ways it is. Once again, the opponents and proponents of enclosure are locked in battle. Once again, they level at each other. They're competing claims about efficiency, uh, sometimes about sacredness. You can't own the human gene. God wrote those genes. You're a plagiarist if you claim to own it. Um, sometimes they claim that this will disrupt forms of life or destroy free speech and so forth. And the arguments fly back and forth. Should it be the second enclosure movement, I've argued no, that there are actually very good reasons to be at least skeptical at least skeptical of all of this. But the thing is um, that it's not enough merely to make an argument. Um, this is not a process where one can simply say, oh, by the way, you're wrong. Um, and everyone will say, oh, I thought I just, you know, the figures were wrong. Of course, we'll change our plans. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, this is an area where we need a change in a way of thinking rather than simply an argument being deployed. So what are our tools for this change in the way of thinking? As we try to make people say, there is a value to the commons. There is a value to the public domain. This, too, is a part of creative activity. How do you make people see something that is literally invisible? Um, I'm going to uh, develop an argument here somewhat briefly that, that runs through the history of sort of skepticism about intellectual property at lightning speed and argues that we have sort of three major strands of skepticism about it, often contradictory, often using the same words in different ways, and that these three strands of skepticism about intellectual property actually should be, uh, could be mobilized, could be put together into the kind of change in the way of thinking that I'm talking about. So what are our tools? Um, There have been, for since intellectual property's inception, there have been skeptics about intellectual property. Um, unfortunately, they tend to write. They started off writing really well, and you know, I think no, even the people in this room would acknowledge that we're perhaps not up to the standards of Jefferson or Madison uh, in our skepticism about intellectual property. One of the things that is, is most striking about reading um, the history of intellectual property, particularly if you look, let's say, starting at the, the, in the, with the framers of the Constitution, they make a number of points. First, they say, we think we need intellectual property. We're a poor country. Um, we largely have to rely on stealing other countries' technologies, um, uh, which we're doing. Um, we don't have the money to hand out grants in order to encourage people. We can't fund science at a basic level. Um, land grants to encourage inventors was one idea they toy with, and they decide that's not going to work. We're going to have to hand out intellectual property rights. And immediately, at the end of every sentence in which we say they, we're going to have to hand out intellectual property rights, they immediately warn us of the dangers of all of this. They say these are monopolies. These are dangerous. There are problems here. Um, they say again and again, these are not absolute rights, Jefferson says. Stable ownership is the gift of social law is given late in the progress of society. It would be curious then if an idea, the fugitive fermentation of an individual brain, could of natural right be claimed in exclusive and stable property. State granted incentive, yes. Permanent, natural, or absolute and exclusive right, no. What's more, he says, this can be done or not done, and no one can complain either way. Um, 
Society may give an exclusive right to the profits arising from inventions as an encouragement to men to produce ideas which may produce a utility, but this may or may not be done according to the will and convenience of society without claim or complaint from anybody. Um, Macaulay, uh, uh, my countryman, um, has a wonderful speech in 1841 to the House of Commons. He was, by, means, by the way, by no means the most radical critic of copyright at this time. Many of the others saw copyright as a blatant tax on literacy, uh, which was designed to make sure the poor didn't get access to newspapers and therefore uh, be able to participate in popular governance. Macaulay was much milder. Uh, he says, we have then only one resource left. We must betake ourselves to copyright. Be the inconveniences of copyright what they may. Those inconveniences, in truth, are neither few nor small. Copyright is monopoly and produces all the effects which the general voice of mankind attributes to monopoly. Well, what are those vices? He said, the effect of monopoly generally is to make articles scarce, to make them dear, and to make them bad. Um, so this is a person who says, yes, we must do it, but there's a real cost here. Limitation must be built into every grant. This language, and I expand on it more in my paper, is a sort of classic... Scottish Enlightenment, I had to get that plug in there. Scottish Enlightenment, free trade, skepticism about monopolies, they may be necessary, they must be finely limited, curtailed, and constantly watched because they introduce a danger of corruption, a richer term in their uh, era than it is in ours. The danger of corruption, a factual, factional capture. Um, they conjured up the idea that we now see in current campaign finance uh, and in current lobbying a quite, a really, you give a monopoly to someone, it is an incentive for governmental corruption. You are setting up a continuing system of incentives designed to ensure the corruption of your government. This is, in fact, a danger that we should be careful about. However, something bears noticing here. Many of the criticisms that are made by the writers of the uh, 18th and 19th centuries are familiar. They worry about high prices. They worry about artificial scarcity. They worry about restricting access, which could be given because although they don't say, because the marginal cost of the good is zero, that's what they're getting at. They worry about the control that might be given to someone. Uh, Macaulay worries about giving control to the copyright holder. Might the copyright holder decide not to release something, to control something, to stop a parody? Can you say, the wind done gone? Not to allow a new edition. Um, what they don't do is they, they frame, what they don't do is say, let's talk about the public domain. Instead, they frame their arguments as criticisms of intellectual property, not defenses of some kind of public domain that exists outside of the world of intellectual property. And a linked point, they just say again and again, monopoly is bad, monopoly is bad. But without the monopoly, you get what? That's not so clear. Um, outside, a norm of freedom, to be sure, but what kind of freedom? Free trade? Free, free in the sense of for no pay? free in the sense of uncontrolled by a single entity so that no one could stop it being circulated, even if you actually have to pay to get it. That's left unsaid. So negative criticisms, criticisms framed as, as attacks on monopoly, although rich ones to be sure, criticisms that don't articulate a defense of a public domain and which leave unspecified what norm of freedom it is we're seeking to instantiate. Um, the next, moving at lightning speed through the history of skepticism about intellectual property, we next come to um, the moment that I call recognizing the public domain after the article written by my colleague David Lang. Uh, but I'll start not with him, but with the Supreme Court, uh, working from the less to the more prestigious. Um, the Congress, in the exercise of the patent power, may not overreach the restraints imposed by the stated constitutional purpose, nor may it enlarge the patent monopoly without regard to the innovation, advancement, or social benefit thereby. Moreover, Congress may not authorize the issuance of patents whose effects are to remove existent knowledge from the public domain or to restrict free access to materials already available. This is a different picture. Yes, we still have the negative critique, but now we have the public domain. Something which is out there, something which there seems to be some right to, some right of access to, right? not just a formal right. You can't even make rights that might restrict access. A lot of people argue about when the fascination with and the scholarship about the public domain begins. Like most people, I would uh, say that my colleague David Lang's work is extremely important here. David, in a wonderful article, Recognizing the Public Domain, says that Intellectual property must always accept something akin to a no-man's land at the boundaries. 
doubtful cases ought to always be resolved in favor of the defendant. The other point is that no exclusive interest should have affirmative recognition unless its conceptual opposite is also recognized. Each right ought to be marked off clearly against the public domain. So now we have a different vision. There's now two competing fields here. Not just a critique of IP, but a defense of the public domain. Jessica Littman's um, uh, work, uh, her article, The Public Domain, which, which uh, is also incredibly important here, she has a very terse definition. The public domain is a commons that includes those aspects of copyrighted work which copyright does not protect. Because she sees the function of the public domain as allowing for additive and interstitial creation, for the kind of follow-on creation which actually makes uh, creative activity possible, her definition of the public domain is includes unprotected elements of copyrighted works as well as entire works which are entirely in the public domain. Just to be clear about this, this is not just that the public domain consists of those things which are completely unprotected by anything, but also includes those privileges which you and I have. For example, our fair use privilege to parody or criticism. The public domain, in other words, extends into the works, protects portions of them. It's a jagged coastline here. If I had time, and if you had patience, but we have neither, I would explore the way in which the conception of the public domain in analytic terms has mirrored the current dominant conception of property at the time the public domain was being defined. When lawyers think of property rights as absolute, firm, vacuum-bounded spheres, it's remarkable to see how the public domain is described in similarly absolute terms. Complete works, completely free. When lawyers think of property as a bundle of rights, a merely a grab bag of different rights, privilege, powers, and immunities, the public domain is similarly analytically complex. You have public domain rights over all kinds of protected objects. Yohai Benkler has a, a slightly different definition. He says, the public domain is the range of uses of information that any person is privileged to make absent individualized facts that make a particular use by a person unprivileged. Conversely, the enclosed domain is the range of uses of information as to which someone has an exclusive right and that no other person may make absent individualized facts. And he says what this does is add to the traditional definition of the public domain the easy cases. Bankler's concern is not so much a formal legal definition. Bankler wants to know what stuff do I know I can use? He wants to speak not to lawyers but to people and to say what stuff do people know they can use? That's what the public domain is. It's a functional definition from the point of view of the citizen, potential, future creator, user, collager, what have you. Not a definition from the point of view of a property theorist defining from the top uh, in terms of rules, powers, privileges, and immunities. I could go on um, laying out some of the different definitions, but let me just say this. There are a fair number of definitions of the public domain. They're not entirely consistent. Even some of the people in this room, and I would certainly point to myself, don't always use that term consistently. The term is analytically complex. You have to figure out what's in it and what's out of it. But what's also interesting is it's not clear what it's for. Why do we care about the public domain? This second portion of my talk, when I talk not about the problems of the enclosure movement, but rather about the tools we have, should really be called the opposite of property. Because my thesis, which I try to play out in the paper, and which I'm simply going to state flatly here, is we have defined the public domain, multiple public domains, in fact, around the perceived evils that property creates. The person who is worried about those who won't get access to the low-cost or free resources that they need to produce something else, focus on cost and freedom from cost in their definition. The person who is worried about single entity control, perhaps introducing monopoly blockage either on creative expression or further development of innovation, focuses on that. They don't care so much about whether or not you have to pay. They care about whether or not anyone can stop you from getting access if you can pay some flat fee. And so on and so on. This is the opposite of property then, not just analytically, absolute, complex, but also in its aspirations, in its hopes and fears, in the dystopias and utopias it conjures up, we have built our public domain around our fears of the property system. And we have multiple fears about the property system. Thus, we have multiple public domains. Alongside this language of the public domain is another language. You heard it in Jessica Littman's definition, the language of the commons, a third term 
enters here. We have the commons, the public domain. Are the two things the same? Are they related to each other? Larry Lessig says, it's commonplace to think about the internet as a kind of commons. It's less commonplace to actually have an idea what a commons is. By a commons, I mean a resource that is free, not necessarily zero cost, but if there is a cost, it is neutrally imposed or equally imposed. Central Park is a commons. The public streets are a commons. Fermat's last theorem is a commons. Open source or free software is a commons. The source code lies available for anyone to take, to use, to improve, or advance. And he ends up by saying that basically anything protected by what well, law professors, at least, I don't know about lawyers, would uh, say were protected by a liability rule rather than a property rule could be considered as a portion of the commons. The key here is that there is no one person who may say, you may not enter. That's what he's focusing on in the commons. What's this language of commons? I mean, what, you know, another county heard from. What's this now? Is this a third thing, the same thing? Again, assertion rather than argument, two things are happening here. One is that people struggling to define an affirmative vision in opposition to expanding intellectual property are turning back to the first enclosure movement and saying, there was this commons, and you turned it over to some private parties. That's a, a descriptive analogical use. The second is perhaps more interesting for the um, property theorist. People are turning to the theorists of the commons, who are well represented here today, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, my colleague Meg McKean, um, uh, Bob Cohan, and others have written about the way in which, and Carol Rose, most notably, uh, in terms of the, their wonderful article, The Comedy of the Commons, have said the commonses are not always tragedies, that in fact collectively managed resources, may, that may actually be more efficient than private management. And to this notion that, hey, maybe private property, maybe this actually isn't wonderful, maybe the enclosure movement isn't always good, even when we're talking about tangible property, when we're talking about fisheries or airspace or whatever, to take that and to apply that notion of the commons to say, are there collective management regimes that could work for the intellectual commons, has been a fascinating project. So what we have then, because I'm going to cut this analysis short, is three things going on. There's the criticism of the problems with intellectual property. There's the multiple competing ideas about the public domain, both analytically and in terms of their aspiration, somewhat fractured and fragmented. Plus, there's this other language of a commons, which doesn't so much say property as opposed to free, but rather says individual as opposed to communal, or collectively managed as opposed to individually managed. It is arguable that you can define open source software as a commons. It would be very hard to say that it's in the public domain. There are multiple restraints, in fact, on what you can do with open source software. That's what makes the system work. From the opposite of property being nothing, freedom, we now have the opposite of property being a different kind of regime, a communal management regime which allows for different things. And all these terms come together. What does this produce? Well, it produces for a certain degree of confusion, I think we have to say. Um, here's a line from a... Um, skeptical academic, uh, Professor Samuels, who uh, in, a, in a fine article uh, noticed that there had been all of this brouhaha by the public domain and reviewed uh, some of the major theorists, including the ones I've discussed, and concluded that there really just wasn't much there. Um, after reviewing the various proposed arguments, he says, supporting a general theory of the public domain, it would appear that there's simply no such general theory. Instead, there are several discrete contexts in which arguments about the public domain are encountered, each context raising different considerations that may have nothing to do with each other, and that cumulatively constitute what remains after one examines all the possible sources of legal protection. This is a residuum, right? What's left? The public domain. It's what's left. If what, what is to be gained, he says, what is gained by reifying the negative? and imagining a theory of the public domain. What's to be gained by reifying the negative? Why do I say this is the stuff that isn't property? If one wants to encourage a presumption against new areas of protection, one can do so without having to invoke some magical public domain. The arguments in each context should be kept separate. In each case, there are different arguments, he goes on to say. We should weigh each of them. Is this particular expansion good or bad? We should just do a case-by-case -case analysis and either extend or not extend property rights. Nevertheless, he says, um, if those who continually find themselves on the side arguing for limitation of protection need a rallying cry, perhaps it can be public domain. 
This invocation may seem to add a moral overtone to the argument to counterbalance the morally charged principles invoked time and time again by the protectionists. In the final analysis, however, such vague rhetoric does little more than adorn a stage on which the actual choices must be played out. Now, this is a powerful and, I think, intellectually a fair and well-mounted criticism. What's to be gained by reifying the negative? You guys basically just have a bunch of contradictory definitions of something that's just what's left, which you wave around in some vague way to say that expanding intellectual property is bad. Fine, if you want to wave it around, but don't pretend there's a theory of the public domain. You're just looking for rhetoric. Is this true? I would argue not. The analogy I've tried to develop in my writing is of the environmental movement. Play out Professor Samuel's skepticism against the notion of the environment. Why think of some general notion of the environment? Why not simply weigh each development proposal, this nuclear power plant, this CFC emission, that move towards solid waste burning, weigh its costs and benefits and decide whether or not to do it. What does then some vague notion of the environment add to all of this? What is to be gained by reifying the negative? Well, it's the, uh, the question seems silly. Well, what is to be gained by reifying the negative in the environmental case? If the answer is it's so clear that the environment, and note, the environment is, after all, a term that is used in lots of different ways by different people, quite contradictory terms. The ideas of nature and the environment are used in very different ways, as we see even within the environmental movement itself. What's to be gained then by reifying the negative? The answer, I think, is twofold. One part of it has to do with what I would see as the, the program for kind of activism and action. The second, intimately related to the first, has to do with what I see as the program for scholarship and analysis. The environment is an articulation of a shared interest which actually calls that interest into being. I'm a bird watcher, you're a duck hunter, you're worried about the genetic drift in salmon stalks, you would like your children not to have burning canals next to their houses. What links us together? Well, if we're just thinking about each proposal on its own merits, nothing. Particularly the duck hunter, the bird watcher, you know, I like to kill them, you like to watch them. What's the, what's the connection there? The environment moves the analysis to a level of generality at which we say there's an enormous connection. Without wetlands, neither of us can do either of these things. We start to think of our environmental services. We start to think of the way in which there is, in fact, a common interest. One of the big problems in intellectual property organization to organize those who are the beneficiaries of the public domain, and that is, I would argue, all of us, is what ties us together? What ties the librarian to the researcher to the open source software developer to the appropriationist artist? What's our common link? These things are very different. Answer, the articulation of an interest in the public domain ties people together in the same way as the articulation of an interest in the environment. Manages to get the person who's worried about salmon stocks in Maine to say, you know, maybe I do give money to Greenpeace even though Greenpeace doesn't just fight for salmon stocks in Maine. It creates a coalition. And this may seem unusual that ideas can create a coalition, but I believe that they can. We come to see the, our interests in a way that is beyond what the economists told us is possible. It is possible for people to develop new conceptions of self-interest. We have seen it happen. The second thing, more analytically based, is that the environment makes us concentrate on things that, are, that matter. It makes it focuses us on, for example, how to think about ecologies, how to think about externalities in the production of uh, 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 industrial goods, how to, inter to an analyze environmental services. By naming, we create a field in which we start to see connections that did not exist before. I won't go into why I believe Ludwig Wittgenstein was right about this, but I think he was. OK. So at its best, then, I think the answer to Professor Samuels is, First of all, a little bit of a confession. You know you're right. The term the public domain and the term the commons have been used in multiple ways, some of them contradictory, some of them overlapping, in different projects, some of them seeking to instantiate communal control of a resource and management, some of them seeking to ensure free access, some of them seeking something else altogether. True. Confession. Second, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be clearer about what we're doing or about the definition of our terms. Perhaps we'd understand what we're doing a little bit better. But the same exact thing is true of the environment. And that analogy, it seems to me, offers the Ariadne's thread that leads us out of this confusion. 
At its best, the concept of the environment allows a generalized reflection on the otherwise unquestionable presumptions of a form of life, of a mode of economy. It makes us say, wait, that's right. I mean, maybe just consuming endlessly has cost. Maybe it's not necessarily a good thing. I mean, let's reflect on this. What do we want? It allows us to think forward in time, to have a kind of intergenerational ethic. At their best, the ideas of the commons and the public domain could do the same thing in helping us to reimagine innovation, culture, speech, creativity on a global network. They could be the organizing principles, the seed crystals around which our ideas accrete. And this seems particularly important today. The poem I began with ends, and geese will still a common lack until they go and steal it back. I can't match the terseness or the rhyme, but as I end my paper by saying, if we assume that the second enclosure would have the same benign effects as the first enclosure movement, we'd look like very silly geese indeed. And there my, my paper finished. That was a paper which was written a long time ago. It was written on October, in October, uh, October 1st. Things have changed since then. How have they changed? Well, partly they've changed because I've read all the other papers for the uh, panel. I was going to end by saying, we need a map of the public domain. <laughs> I'm Samuelson, rather presumptuously, I have to say, put one in her article. We need other models of communal property. Carol Rose explored Roman law in order to look about the multiple ways in which Roman law considered property that wasn't simply sole and despotic dominion. We need a clarification of the different roles of the commons in science, in culture, and in art. Look at the papers. We need a connection between what we're doing here in academic terms and what we're doing here as public intellectuals and citizens and activists. Welcome. Thank you.